Uh, thank you, thank you for joining us for this event. My name is Bill Leggett, and I'm a bookseller at Powell's Books. And before we begin, I want to encourage you to check out our lineup of upcoming virtual events by visiting our website at powells.com. One of the many great events we're looking forward to is Megan Margulies in conversation with Jackie Nodell on Thursday, August 23rd, where they will discuss Megan's new book, My Captain America. Please consider following us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. As well, if you haven't already done so, please sign up for our weekly events email at powells.com. Right now, we're honored to welcome Lisa Hanawalt in conversation with Emily Heller about Lisa's book, I Want You. Lisa Hanawalt is the creator and showrunner of Tuca and Birdie, an adult animated series for Netflix. She's also the production designer slash producer of the Netflix series, Bojack Horseman. And she has written and illustrated four books published by Drawn and Quarterly, My Dirty Dumb Eyes, Hot Dog Taste Test, Coyote, Dog Girl, and today's book, I Want You. And she hosts the Baby Geniuses podcast with Emily Heller on the Maximum Fun Network. Lisa's joined in conversation by her podcast partner, Emily Heller, who is a comedian, writer, and actor. She's performed stand-up on shows including Conan, Late Night with Seth Meyers, and At Midnight, in addition to her own specials on Comedy Central. Emily's writing credits include the shows Barry, Search Party, Medical Police, and People of Earth. She's also acted on shows like Marin, Inside Amy Schumer, Grace and Frankie, and Bojack Horseman. This event will also include an audience Q&A. Please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen if you'd like to ask a question. As well, if someone has typed a question that you'd also like to know the answer to, please consider upvoting that question by clicking the thumbs up button. And most importantly, please consider supporting both Lisa Hanawalt and Powell's by purchasing a copy of the book. I want you. A link to buy the book will be shared in the chat this evening. Lisa, Emily, it is great to welcome you both. Thank you for joining us and have a wonderful event. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Lisa. How's it going? Hi, Emily. It's going great. Hi, everybody. Um, Thanks for joining us today. Hi, everyone. I'm so excited that we get to talk about Lisa's book, I Want You, which is not what this is not what it looks like. Look at Lisa's screen. Don't look at mine. I have but, a green screen. But look so. at Emily's screen because it looks so weird. It looks all yeah. Lacy. Oh, yeah. I love that. I wish that's what the cover actually looked like. Yeah, just translucent. Yeah. <laughs> just can a we... lace book. I'll ask John and Corley if we can do that for the next run. Yeah, next time around. Yeah. Um, so, so let's talk about this. It's a collection of some of your earlier, would you say your comics and your zines? Yeah, my mini comics. Uh, weird zines I made, some rarities, <laughs> some previously unpublished comics, and a lot of like animal drawings that I was making <laughs> at the time. Um, so yeah, let's talk about that. So talk about, can you talk about what the first distribution was like for the comics that people will find in this book and who you imagined your audience being? Because you wrote it when you were in your 20s, right? Yeah. Um, some of the earlier ones I think I made when I was like 23, and you're now And you're now 61. <laughs> <laughs> I'm turning 62 tomorrow. Um, and uh, who was my audience? That's a great question. I, when I first made the mini comics, I only, I, like I'd print like 200 of them and then I would hand them out to people and I was going to like really small comics conventions and selling them for like five bucks each. And I never expected many people to like them, but then like I, that first time I went to Comic-Con, I remember people were holding my mini comic, um, Stay Away From Other People, and they were laughing at it. Like, like people were gathering around and laughing um, and it was exciting. Cause I'm like, these are strangers looking at my weird stuff. Um, so I printed more, but like, I, I don't think I made more than like, 2,000 of them total. Um, I'm, I'm really mad I can't find my copy of I Want You Number Two. Because You know what? I should, I should grab them off the shelf. Here, let's you look should. at the shelf. Here's my shelf. Hold on one moment. <laughs> yes. Okay, now I can illustrate what I'm talking about. So this is I Want You, or no, this is Stay Away From Other People, which is like one of my first um, mini comics that I put out. And then, and I'd made like zines in high school that I passed out to friends and stuff. So I, I'd already been like, I was, I was familiar with Kinko's. 
<laughs> Does anyone know what a Kinko's is anymore? No. <laughs> um, it's FedEx Kinko's now. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and then, um, so this was I Want You One, I Want You Two. I think this was like 2008 and this was 2009 or something like that. Um, so these uh, were actually put out by a publisher, Pigeon Press. So they put out like a few thousand of them at first, I think. It's still like a pretty small run. Um, and yeah, then, you know, I've, I've made a bunch of other minis that are like collected in this book and these I maybe made like a couple hundred each. So, so they're pretty, pretty rare. This one's very rare. This cat drawing. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one thing that I was thinking about as I was reading this book is, you know, the stuff you wrote in it, you, you when you first put it out, I don't, I'm assuming you didn't expect a, a large audience for it, but now you are someone who does have a large audience. You have a higher profile. I'm sure this book will end up in way more hands than you expected this material to. How does that make you feel? Oh my God. I mean, that's, I think you're really getting to the core of why I felt so like a frightened and ambivalent when I was first deciding whether to reprint this. <laughs> Cause th these things were never designed for a large audience. Um, and so I had to really like kind of look things over and, and analyze them with my, you know, I, I like to think I have like a slightly more sophisticated approach to certain ideas now that it's over 10 years later. Um, so yeah, some stuff like didn't really measure up to my standards. Um, there wasn't anything that bad, but just not all of it is good. And uh, I had to be, in the end, I had to just be okay with like people kind of seeing it. Yeah, I mean, hopefully the people who are reading this understand the context in which it was put out. And yeah, I mean, there's nothing in here that's like prob like super problematic, I would say. It's there not... is a Confederate flag I found. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. But it's uh, it's like a racist bison who's wearing it. Okay, At, as long as that's it's, the case, it's still. I mean, it's satirical. Remember? Like it's um, so like yeah, this bison is wearing. <laughs> Oof. Yeah. Yeah. But, but this, this comic is about like all of, you know, America. Like I went on a road trip across the country and these are just like American inspired hats. So yes. that is, that is a part of America, an ugly part of it. An ugly part of America. <laughs> um, I will say, so our, a little bit about our history with each other that people uh, who listen to our podcast have heard the story a million times. I was introduced to your work by Matt Fury, who encouraged me to buy your zine, I Want You, at the Alternative Press Expo in San Francisco. So I knew who you were before we met. We met in New York after I had already like had some of your comics and stuff. Um, <laughs> and so for, I mean, for my own personal experience, reading this book, especially because your art has changed so much, I think, in the time since you put this out originally and now, reading it for me it felt like sort of returning to this image of you before i met you and had yeah. all my illusions shattered <laughs> um, yeah i always wonder like how is that different from what you expected like because like i don't know whenever i meet a cartoonist i'm always like oh you're not like a complete psychopath you're like a nice lovely person <laughs> i think it's my usual reaction i thought you were like the coolest person in the world and i still think you're cool but <laughs> I, I just know now that you party less than it looks like. <laughs> I'm That's a nerd. <laughs> oh, no. Main disillusionment, I would say. Um, um, but it really does feel like you're in a different phase in your life in the work that's in this book. And I know you discussed this in the introduction a little bit, but what was it like for you to sort of spend time with this younger version of yourself as you were putting this collection together? It was interesting. Like I, I was, I was really hesitant to dive back into looking at this work because I thought it would be kind of painful and it would bring up like weird memories. Um, and you know, sometimes it's it's easy to look at your younger self as like not fully formed, like it's like a half baked version of you. But then, when I looked at it, there were things I really liked, um, and I kind of remembered my headspace at the time. And like, um, I was working really hard, and I had a really different drawing style and. I was, I was just sort of learning how to put together stories. <clears throat> and now I can kind of see the evolution of that into what I do now. Um, so I guess I have more compassion for my younger self. 
<laughs> well, I mean, I will say like, obviously I think that you're a very talented person who has continued to grow and stuff, but there's work in this where I'm not, it's not like I read it and I think like, oof, she had a long way to go. Like, <laughs> I don't feel like that reading it too. It feels like you have your voice already. Oh, that's nice. That's yeah. good. I, I feel good. mixed. When, there's some parts I, where I look at it and I think, oof, and some parts, um, for the most part, I'm like, oh no, this is like actually a, a funny joke. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, maybe I'm projecting, but I know for myself, like some of the jokes that I wrote when I first started stand up are definitely better than anything I wrote later. Oh, that's so frustrating. <laughs> Isn't it? <laughs> yeah. I've definitely become a worse comedian as time has gone on in a lot of ways. <laughs> um, you think? I don't think so. I think so. I think I was better when I was in New York and I was like hungry and oh. like just, it was all I, all you, when your art is the thing that you're just like want to spend all your time doing instead of, you know. The yeah, thing that, that hunger really goes away. Like, and I always, I was always really afraid of that. I was afraid of losing that. And now that I kind of have, I'm like, eh. What, what, <laughs> what are you gonna do? It's okay to not be that hungry. <laughs> it's fine. I was, I had like endless energy for sitting hunched over a desk and drawing tight, tight little details um, and just not having any other outside life whatsoever. And now I just can't do that physically or mentally anymore. Um, that I didn't, brings me, sorry, continue. No, I just kind of, I didn't understand that. I didn't understand that it's not just that you're more tired or foggy headed it's just you don't want to <laughs> you don't want to hunch over a desk all day like that's exciting when you're young and you're getting started in your career and now I I'm can't just wait like, for the I'm excited to do other things like I want to go outside <laughs> <laughs> I want the follow-up to I want you to be I don't wanna <laughs> I don't want to <laughs> <laughs> leave me alone <laughs> it's just, leave I want me out. <laughs> I want you to let me retire. <laughs> <laughs> I want to garden. Um, <laughs> I want to go you, play with a horse. You brought up the way that your style has changed and sort of the way that you don't have the endless energy for sort of like sitting cramped over a desk drawing details. Um, the first thing that does really stand out to me about this book is that your your visual style has changed a lot. Oh yeah, like, let's let's look at take oh, a look, look at some of the look line work in this. It's so detailed. It's so yeah, and I mean got, like, you can see kind of behind me Lisa has transitioned to more you know watercolor, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a little looser. And I guess uh you know um some of your more recent work is more like focused on color and texture. I imagine some of that has to do with your medium changing from like Xerox black and white zines to more high quality like publishing and animation. But is that true? Like, like how did that shift happen? And how did it feel for you to return to this old style and reviewing this work? I think part of it was just that I get bored easily. So once I kind of cracked that style and I'd been working in it for a few years, I just got bored of it. I just wanted, I wasn't that good at using color. So a lot of my work was black and white and I would sometimes try to color it with markers or digitally, but it looked bad. Like I didn't have a good sense of color yet. I didn't have any understanding of it. So then I started working with color more in like 2012, 2013, when I started doing more actual illustration work, like editorial illustration. And I did like a children's book and I just, very slowly got more comfortable with it and I got like a nice watercolor set and um it just got more fun to to loosen up more um I I think I I could still draw in this style uh it would probably hurt my arm a little but I could do it but I'm just sort of like uh, I've done that I figured that out it is it is really sort of like mind-blowing and impressive how much detail is in these drawings but I don't blame you for shifting away um, as someone who is sort of like a, you know, more amateur artist who I've always been really impressed by people who can work with color well, and it sounds like you've sort of taught yourself how to do it. What do you recommend for people who want to learn how to experiment with color more in their work? It's hard. I don't quite know when it clicked for me because uh, I was really bad at it for a long time. Like my first publisher said, you have no sense of color. <laughs> <laughs> and he was right. Um, oh and it was really just like experimenting and just like 
you know, if you're doing digital, you can just drag that Photoshop hue thing back and forth and just kind of looking, it was a lot of just like looking at work that looks really nice and has the look I want, whether that's like, you know, color can be electric or it can be soothing. Um, and just by doing it over and over again, just getting a sense of what is getting the, the end product that I want. Um, there was, I don't have, I feel like some artists really have a formula for figuring out color. Like they literally, they have like a triangle with like, <laughs> like yeah, or the, the wheel. They have like a wheel or a triangle. I don't have a shape. I just, um, <laughs> sometimes I literally just go and I just like pick out like a bunch of gouache and I just pick out like five colors that are pretty. And I, I'm just like, these are the colors I'm going to use. I think, I think limiting color is like one thing that I've learned that's helpful. Like, I think, like sometimes I, I give Adam drawing lessons just for fun and I'll be like, okay, pick two colors. And those are the ones you could use. Ooh, um, I like that. So get like, you know, like a dark shade and a medium shade and it can be like purple and green or whatever. It doesn't matter what color, but just get a dark and a light one and then figure out a way to use them to create an image. I think it trains you a little bit, but I always want to use they, every color in the box. <laughs> yeah. Are there any colors that you don't like? I try to avoid black actually in a lot of uh, art because I think it's sometimes more interesting to try to get dark tones by building up other colors, like a lot of blue and brown, but that depends. It's funny because I used to use only black and white and now I'm trying to avoid black or white. Um, but no, there's no colors I, I dislike. They're all great. Um, how important is it to have like a pen or a brush that you really like? It's funny because I always joke around with other artists, like, like whenever you post something online, people are like, what pen did you use? You know, it's like a funny thing. Um, and we're always like, it doesn't matter, but then it does. Like the kind of pen you use will absolutely change the way you draw. Um, <laughs> yeah. I think it's bad to get locked into one pen and be like, this is the only pen I use. This is the one, you know, I think it's, it's better to experiment. So uh, I feel like like on jetpens.com, they have just like, you can get like a set of like 10 different brush pens. And I think that's so fun because then you can just try them all and do yeah. little tests and figure out which one you like. Um, and it'll totally like change how you draw. Um, but there's like also I, a learning curve with each new tool. I just got this like bullshit marker set where like <laughs> one side of the pen is like a brush and one side is like a finer felt tip but they're different colors. And, and so there's some colors that only come in like the brush texture or the fine. And I'm like, that's so bullshit. I can only use red as the brush pen. I don't get. That's bullshit. They should, it should be both. It should be the same color for both. So you can, what Jesus. I got taken for a ride. You really did. What is this amateur hour? Come on. <laughs> Who's, they just let anyone make markers these days. <laughs> um, Okay, returning to the book. <laughs> oh yeah, this uh, book. Yes. Uh, <laughs> another thing that I think is interesting uh, about reading this book, especially as someone who's familiar with your work now, is there are some things in here that, like, you can see these characters and themes that sort of feel like throwaways or background gags or one-offs that I know eventually get a larger focus in your later work. Yeah. So, is, huh? I said, yeah. yeah. So, like, the sex bugs, for example, show up in, um, they get, I think, their own page, but then they also show up in the background of a couple of the other comics. How does something like the sex bugs go from a background gag to the subject of an entire episode of Tuca and Birdie? Was it something that you knew you wanted to devote more creative space to when you first created it? Or when you were creating Tuca and Birdie, did you go back and mine your old work for characters and stuff? Uh, I didn't know. I think it's just sometimes I'll just make up something and then if I just like it, I'll just keep using it. Like, like sex bugs is just such a funny, like, I just like the way the words sound together, sex bugs. And then, um, I think in this, this page where they have like their concert, like, like Raphael, um, who's the creator of Bojack and producer on Tuca Birdie had made up this little, like we started singing this song together. Uh, we know that we repulse you with our inside outside hugs. We're the sex bugs, sex bugs. <laughs> It was like, um, yeah, so he like, we made up this song together. Um, and then awesome. I, I just think they're funny. So, and I think, yeah, when I, I wasn't purposely like mining old work when we did Tuca and Birdie, I just still thought like this sex bugs things, this has, <laughs> it's this got has, legs. It's got, got legs. legs. <laughs> it's got legs. 
cheeks and genitals. <laughs> oh yeah, I forgot I did like the little, the border of them. Um, yeah. So like, it's funny, I have like a limited amount of things that I keep going back back to like motifs or whatever. So like bugs, sex characteristics, snakes, like I just, those things kind of happen over and over again in my work. I guess that's okay. <laughs> No, I think it's good. It makes it feel very intentional. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so one of the things that you and I bonded over when we first met is that we both have a very <laughs> robust appetite for gross-out jokes. <laughs> can't get um, enough of them. Yum, yum, yum. Can't get enough of them. That being said, there is one <laughs> image in this book that almost made me barf. Oh, and what is it? What <laughs> I want you to guess what it is. Uh, oh man, is it, is it like the, the worms in the apple? No. Very close. Very close. Is it close in page or close in um, theme? Close in theme. Uh, I'll give you a hint. Do you want a hint? Yeah. It's in the section, uh, worst sandwiches. <laughs> I don't, oh, is it the, the, oh, is it that one? Of course it's that one. Oh, which, oh, oh look how ugly my nails look right now. Oops, sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry. I didn't do my nails. Um, that, I like how you're apologizing that and then right underneath your hand, there's a guy eating a sandwich with his own penis in it. <laughs> like, oh, my nails are gross. Sorry. Oh, geez. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not performing femininity. <laughs> Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> wow. What a contradictory person I am. Um, yeah, yeah, this is super gross and multitudes. scary. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very complicated. Um, this is uh, really gross. I'm just going to keep this up here while we talk. Is that okay? <laughs> oh, God, put it away. It's so disgusting. And there's so much gross stuff in this book, and that's the only thing that really repulsed me in a, way, in a, in a true way. Uh, what are your, <laughs> do you have favorite excerpts of things that are in this book? Do you have favorite things that you found? I like, I do really like the, this is such a weird page. The common dirty talk and the question it, questions it raises is such a weird comic because it's like mostly text. <laughs> um, it's mostly text and I will say it's like almost 100% joke answers. <laughs> no questions and answers. <laughs> it just says, it's like, it's just absurd, but I just think it's funny. And I, uh, question seven makes me laugh. I would like for us to be a fuck factory and find the most efficient way to harness that energy and sell it while also saving on commercial property rental costs. And then the question is, do you envision a mom and pop type business or a larger corporation or chain? Should we hire employees or rely on contractors who can fuck from home? I think that's funny. <laughs> I don't know what was going through my head when I wrote that. I don't remember it. Yeah, you were clearly very horny. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I mean, I was horny while I made the whole thing. Yeah, this is a very horny book, and I like that about it. All my books, I think. All your books are very horny. I, I think I make my best work when I'm horny. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now's as good a time as any to say that in the chat, you can find links to order Lisa's book, and you can get, I think, with a signed book plate. Is that the offer, I believe, from Powell's? So yeah, check it out. Yeah. Um, I feel like I don't have a ton more questions that I want to ask, but it seems like the people watching have a ton of questions that they want to ask. That's good. Um, one person asked, what is the best sandwich? We've already... Um, We've addressed what the worst sandwich is. We have, yes. <laughs> What's the best sandwich? Um, I made a pretty good one today. Oh, did you? I made one, a really good one the other day, too, yeah, but... I like this sandwiches in general. I like a PB and J. I like a tuna. I like a like a big Italian sandwich that you can like dip in tomato sauce <laughs> with lots of like meat and cheese on it. Okay. <laughs> um, that's like sometimes Adam will get those and then he'll let me have a bite, but sometimes I get my own. <laughs> <laughs> you sound like you're being locked in a tower. <laughs> That's really what that sounded like. <laughs> you know, it's like <laughs> a bite of his sandwich. <laughs> it was more like usually I'll be like, no, no, I don't want one. It'll make me feel sick. And then I'll take a bite anyways. Like I'll mooch off his. It's it's my own thing. 
I ordered from um, Solely Vegan, which is like a vegan soul food place that mm. just, uh, it's, it, the original location's in Oakland, they just opened an LA location, and I got- I saw, I saw a photo of your order, it looked so yes. good, it looked like, like fried chicken. Some, so good, and so I used some of the leftover fried chicken to make a fried chicken sandwich the next day, and it was so good. What is the chicken made out of? Um, seitan. Oh. And I don't know how they make the breading, but it is so good. It's like the closest to KFC that I remember KFC tasting like. Oh my God, that sounds delicious. Um, okay, Sam Schaefer asked, was there any of your old stuff you are excited to republish? Like, do you think the joke was great and you wish it was more widely seen at the time? <laughs> uh, I feel Aside like it was- from the fuck factory. <laughs> it was, well, all of it was seen enough at the time, I'd say. I mean, I did- <laughs> I did always really like this comic, uh, Top Causes of Freeway Accidents, because just each one <laughs> is horse related. Um, and this one, related, yeah. this one's very real. Passing trailers while looking to see if they contain horses. <laughs> My dog just sneezed. Um, <laughs> uh, that one actually happened to me. I was like on the five freeway, like going up over the, the hill, you know, um, before you like descent down to to send down into LA and like I was looking at a trailer I was passing to see like a horse and then I had a panic attack because I was going like 75 miles an hour and I was just like ah <laughs> and I had to pull over. You went into a horse trance. <laughs> I did I like I got too excited because I saw like oh, pony yeah. and it like leaned its head out it was so cute but I almost died. <laughs> it was very dangerous. Oh my goodness. So I like that one I guess. Um, someone asked what's the biggest bird you think you could comfortably beat in a fight? The biggest, I don't know, birds are tough as fuck, man. <laughs> birds can throw down. <laughs> yeah, uh, I don't, I'm not going to try and fight any birds because even the small ones can just peck me and I don't like it. I know. Like, I feel like I could probably beat like a mountain chickadee or like a white bellied nuthatch, but then they're just going to call their friends over and then there'll be like 50 of them. And I'll be like, chip, 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 and it'll be like totally yeah. fucked up. And I've been attacked by three or four birds. Uh, at the same a, time a one month period actually one of the it was, one of them was the same bird two or three times what where's this bird this was in santa cruz when i would be like walking to my job there's this and uh, okay so i've heard that the birds was like based on the birds in santa cruz eating toxic algae and going crazy but uh, <laughs> there are these birds that get these really intense nesting uh you know, yeah. Vibes. And there was this bird that was nesting in this uh, street. You know, why can't I think of the word for like a <laughs> green, yellow, red? <laughs> like a street light, a crossing light. What is it? Dress. <laughs> a dress. <laughs> Oh, you know, a classic green, yellow, red. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, one means go, one means stop. I don't remember which. Yeah, and you're in your little sort of mini one-person choo-choo. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I would have to walk by this traffic light on the way to my job, and I don't know if I was a threat or if my hair just looked like good nesting material, but almost every time that I would <laughs> walk by and the bird saw me, it would come and swoop at my head. <laughs> it was dive bomb. And then I would just like swing my backpack over my head. And try and... <laughs> See what I mean? Birds, you can't trust them. Yeah, I'm not going to take on any of them. Um, anonymous <laughs> attendee asks how tempted were you to redraw and rewrite your old material oh my god not at all i'm not into that <laughs> i think people who do that are nuts <laughs> i think it's such a bad idea i mean i think it's it's okay to like take a theme or an idea you're interested in and like expand on it or write a new story about it but like to actually like sit there and like redraw like something you've already drawn like oh my god no Oh my goodness. Yeah. Never. No. Never, never. Um, yeah, I appreciate that laziness. I mean, I, I could see you wanting to, because sometimes I will, like, if I'm opening up, like, an old script that I've written, I'll, I'll go through and I'll edit stuff, especially if I know someone's going to read it, but. Oh, yeah. 
much easier than what they're yeah. suggesting. And that makes sense. And if you're like using it to present something or trying to sell something, like, yes, you want the best possible version of the thing for sure. Um, yeah. But yeah, stuff that's already been published, it's like, no, that's in the past. Like, shut it in the drawer and move on. Yeah. Or reprint uh, it in a book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, reprint it in a book. <laughs> Um, well, have you, have you ever been tempted to like take something from your old work and be like, I'm going to turn this into a bigger thing? I mean, I guess you have done that with some of the characters in here. Yeah. And I have, it's funny, like I, you know, like I have Coyote Dog Girl, which is like a story that I like. It's a graphic novel I did. Um, I don't think I would ever make like a direct, you know, thing of that. I don't think it would be like the movie version of that, but I think I would maybe expand on that universe or like maybe it would be about her relative or something. Yeah. Um, what about she moose and he horse i mean he horse is kind of like a bojack prototype um yeah that's true and then she she moose i really like she moose is funny because she has like some birdie qualities i think and some tuka qualities but yeah you know, it's so she's me um that brings me to another question from the q a is the process of creating different between autobiographical and real life comics and your narrative work like the Tuka and Birdie comics have showed. Do you feel like they inform and mix with one another? I feel like She Moose and Birdie are both pretty much you in a way. Yeah. And Tuka too, honestly. Tuka's my inside. Yeah. I mean, in a lot of ways. <laughs> uh, a lot of the things Tuka does or, or feels are like things I feel and I'm just like too polite to express sometimes. <laughs> She's my, <laughs> my rude alter ego but like yeah I feel like people who know me well see see me be a tuka sometimes when I'm being really loud or self-centered <laughs> <laughs> um uh yeah it's funny like all, all my work feels deeply personal to me like there's not a whole lot of separation but then if people were to be like well this happened to you like this comic I'd be like no no that's fictional so it's like, I kind of want to have it both ways. Um, yeah. But a lot of them I are like based of... on, on dreams I've had. Like, um, like this one in particular, this is a comic that's never been published before. It's here for the first time. Oh yeah. She just goes to the clinic and it's like this body horror comic where she basically has an abortion, but it's like, it's silly and gross and weird. Uh, and yeah, it's like a, based on a nightmare I had that was just basically about my own fears of like pregnancy um, and abortion. Oh, interesting. Like, yeah. Fright, those things frightened me, even though, you know, I'm pro-abortion, but um, I never published it at the time because I thought like, this is too weird and I don't really know how people are going to feel about this. So I'm just going to hold on to it. And then when it came time to edit this book, like both my literary agent and my publisher were both like, no, we like it. We think it should go in. So I was like, okay, trust you guys. Yeah, it's a really fascinating comic that I think also stands out from the rest of the book in terms of like, even though it is humorous and, you know, it's funny, it is, it does feel kind of more serious in a yeah. way than I think it some was of the getting, other stuff. I think it was getting closer to like what I wanted to continue doing, which is like, it's funny and gross and parts of it seem flippant, but then it is kind of getting to like an honest feeling or an honest, you know, kind of sad scary emotion um yeah and you also it's really surprising too you think you know where it's going and I'm just going to keep being super vague about it so people will have to buy the book <laughs> yeah um <laughs> I appreciate that <laughs> yeah it's like a very interesting there's really interesting imagery in it um <laughs> someone asked what did you listen to when you made the work for this book what did I listen to probably what did I like at the time? Probably like a lot of hot chip. <laughs> yeah, I like hot chip. I watch I watch a lot of movies while I'm inking too. Um, oh yeah. So I don't know. I was probably watching like City Slickers. <laughs> <laughs> when I was inking this moose abortion, um, <laughs> I was just watching like Billy Crystal. <laughs> probably just like some Billy Crystal VHS tapes, just played on repeat, and then I rewind them and just play them back. <laughs> um, someone asked who would you voice cast on Tuka and Birdie from Succession who do you think <laughs> <laughs> for those of you who are not familiar with our podcast we both uh, <laughs> <what the fuck? laughs> uh the guy not that, okay. <laughs> we both find uh, to certain be 
intriguing the actor who plays Tom on Succession. Matthew. But honestly, all of them. I mean, I can't even tell you how many times in the in the Zoom writers room we've just completely stopped working to just talk about who we want to fuck on Succession. <laughs> <laughs> like in which combination yeah like, what you want to watch fuck each other <laughs> right and like what sandwich you want to be in and, and I'm like am I am I gonna get canceled for letting this happen like I'm the one in charge here am I I'm supposed to like stop us from discussing this but we're all adults and I think it's fine <laughs> <laughs> I almost accidentally called Alan a slime puppy today and then I was like oh <laughs> <laughs> Alan's my dog not my husband and um, slime, slime puppy is that what uh Jerry calls uh, yeah, it's like the first dirty thing that, let's not spoil anything, but people who know, know. Um, we're, we're obsessed with Succession. It's the best show. Yeah. <laughs> um, what drew you to animating animals with human bodies? I've just always um, drawn that. Like, I found some comics I made when I was, like, seven years old, and they have animal people wearing patterned clothing. I so, love that. I love it. I don't I know why. Like more interested in human heads with animal bodies. Gross. I know. <laughs> That's disgusting. I hate drawing human faces. I mean, it's fun, but I just, I, I can't make them look pretty. I'm not yeah. good at it. But there's something that's nice about, and sort of like, it's still very intimate and personal, but also like sort of easier to project onto with the animal heads. Yes, a lot easier because it doesn't look like a specific kind of person it's just like oh this could be any person because it's it's a goose yeah <laughs> you know anyone can be a goose <laughs> and i think that's the one message people should take away from your work <laughs> um someone asked do either of you still read small press comics any recommendations yes um I like to read stuff that youth in decline puts out uh ryan sands uh publishes small comics and he does like a few every year. Um, check out Youth in Decline. And um, yeah, I like I like zines and mini comics when I get them. Yeah, it's been a long time since I went to the Alternative Press Expo, but I used to just like go and trade stuff and collect as much as I could. It's so fun. I, know I, I feel like they, they've gotten fancier. Like they used to just be like black and white shitty kinkos and now it's like full color, like illustration portfolio. Yeah. Um, I'm like, keep them crappy, keep them cheap. <laughs> The right uh, girl ethos of it. That's um, right. Keep it punk. I was never punk. <laughs> <laughs> Similarly, someone asked, are there any artists or comics that you'd recommend to someone that is a big fan of your work? Oh my God, so many. Um, uh, so There's so many. Where do you even begin? Um, Jillian Tamaki <laughs> is one of my favorites. Michael DeForge. Kate Beaton. She's working on a new book, John Quarterly, that I'm really excited about. Julia Wirtz. It's very funny. Sarah Glidden, uh, uh, Helen Joe, <laughs> wonderful. Oh, yeah. Tara Booth, great cartoonist. Gina Weinbrandt, very funny. Oh yeah, wait, I have Gina's book. Right yeah, here. Um, I blurb it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Please, someone please have sex someone with me. please have sex with me, yeah. See Gina, is... another person who makes comics when she's horny. Yes, this is, if you like horny comics, and also I was thinking about this book when you were talking about your, um, two color exercise that you did with Adam. Oh yes, that's right. Limited colors. Yeah. <clears throat> um, on Instagram, there's a lot of good cartoonists. There's um, uh, Bianca Zunis is a new, newer cartoonist who I really oh, like. Yeah, you put me up on her work and it's really good. Yeah, it's really sweet. Yeah. Oh God, there's so many. There's so many talented people. Um, I'm sure someone, someone went out. <laughs> someone said, any tips for beginning to get small runs of comics professionally printed versus going to Kinko's? Um, they're gonna fuck it up no matter what you do. Like, no matter how well you set up your file, they're gonna mess it up in some really weird way that you hadn't anticipated. So just be ready for that. And <laughs> it's worth it to get it professionally trimmed and uh, stapled. I think it's worth it to save yourself the labor. Um, yeah. But yeah, unless you're like totally cool with it looking sort of crappy. Yeah. It can look or a little really crappy. Good at doing that stuff yourself. That's why I think keep it crappy. Keep that the aesthetic. Because then if something goes wrong, you're just like, well, that's part of it. Um, that's part of it, yeah. It's not, like, don't be too precious, too, because it's just like a little, like, it's supposed to be like a fun, like ephemeral thing. It doesn't have to be perfect. But I'll say, like, even with 
even with bigger pr printing things, there are also always weird problems that come up in production. <laughs> it's amazing. <Yeah. laughs> People do have a lot of questions about what's going to happen in the next season of Tuka and Birdie. Who's going to do voices? I can't like tell that. you that. Can't tell us anything. No. Um, <laughs> Uh, there will be more Tuca and more Birdie and more okay. Speckle and okay. there'll be some plant people and, and um, I'm really excited about it. I think it's funny because I like to look online and I like to search for like what people on Reddit if they're saying like here's what I think will happen in season two and they're always wrong. <laughs> oh really? <laughs> well sometimes they're like they, they start to get the start of an idea that I'm like oh yeah we are kind of maybe doing that but then it just it's so much more elaborate on the show that it's like not something that I would actually find yeah. by searching. People don't That's guess satisfying. that stuff. No, I mean, we come up with such weird shit in the room too. Yeah, and then everything changes and it passes through a bunch of different hands and stuff. It changes so much. I will say in the Barry writer's room, we had an idea for the end of the series and then some <laughs> random person online or like a reporter or something suggested it and then we were like, not doing it anymore. <laughs> not doing it, too obvious, I yeah. guess. Um, someone asked, Lisa, you posted about your appreciation for A-frame houses. Is that your favorite style of house or do you have another fave? I like how they look. Uh, you know, like if you're looking for cabin porn, an A-frame's going to hit the spot. Uh, but yeah. but I you don't can't know if hang I... anything on the walls. I know. I think, I think living with one is hard, maybe. Like maybe it's kind of impractical, but I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I'm obsessed with them, but they're I don't so know cute. If I ever live in one. Yeah. They're so goddamn cute. Let's buy one together. Let's get, <laughs> let's get a cabin. <laughs> yeah. Someone asked, is there anything you wanted to include in this book that you did not get to? No, everything I wanted to, to be in there went in there. Um, yeah. Um, a question I've been ignoring that many people want the answer to is how many LaCroix does Lisa drink a day? That's rude. That's... <laughs> This is a no holds barred discussion about the creative process. <laughs> I find this question accusatory and I'm, I'm just immediately so defensive. <laughs> yeah, you're like this interview is over, you walk out. Uh, how dare you? Um, I, think, I think this is my fourth LaCroix today. Okay, good. Um, that's me trying to hold back. <laughs> that's, me, that's me being like, Lisa, you need to drink some actual water or you're gonna pass out. So yeah, this is me with restraint. Oh. Um, someone asked, what watercolor sets would you recommend? Ooh, um, here, I'll show you my favorite. Let me, here's, here's my second desk. That's right. I have two desks now. Ooh, yeah. Because I never leave this room. <laughs> <laughs> this is where I live. And sometimes Adam gives me one bite of sandwich. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is my favorite palette. And this is, uh, it's called Sennelier. Sennelier. Oh, very um, nice. It's French. Oh no, it's spilling. <laughs> I, re I wrecked it. Um, and it's just like really buttery and good. The colors are very pure. I can't explain it. It's better than any other watercolor I've ever used. And then uh, for gouache, I like the Holbein ones. Here, let me show you. Oh. Okay. Here, I'll, I'll do it like a makeup YouTube. Yes. Like, oh, I yeah. Love, that's my ASMR shit right there. I, I love, love people do the hand thing. Oh, I love it. Why are they all so good at that? Oh, that's Why great. Why that so nice when people do that? It just, it, is it because it makes you feel that's so my question good. about this book. Why is it so nice when people do this? <laughs> Does it make you feel cared for? <laughs> yeah, I don't know why. I think it's there's something very tender about it. Well, because like, it's definitely for my benefit. Yeah. Here, can you see that um, pen that I've I've bended? I bent the thing. <laughs> yeah. It's a bad habit. I it's keep also it's like they're holding it up for like light metering or like like this is the neutral zone. <laughs> the hand. <laughs> I feel like I like these kinds of videos, and Alan would probably like them too because his favorite thing is to lick the hand. Um, <laughs> someone said, I want the deets on that gluten-free pasta Adam was going to make. Oh, uh, it's a tuna pasta and he like, he cooks tuna with sardines in olive oil and then, um, and then adds tomatoes, like a can of crushed tomatoes 
And then he makes like a gluten-free pasta, which we either use like Berea or Ancient Harvest, whatever the grocery store has. And then uh, mix it all together with a ton of cheese. It's so good. Sounds good if you like fish. I love tuna. I think tuna's, I don't like fish, but I love tuna. (laughs) I think it's a very good protein. I used to like it a lot when I, that was the last meat that I gave up. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, someone asked, most overrated art supply? Hmm. And most underrated? For a while, everyone was really into Pentel brush pens, and I think they got overplayed, but they are still a classic. Um, most underrated? Get a really nice brush. It's worth the money. Get like a, like an Isabay brush. Here, wait. Let me find one. Okay. Get this shit okay this one's a skoda do That's the not hand easy. thing do the hand thing <laughs> wait let me grab another one uh am i the most demanding um person who's interviewed you about this book no i like it i need to be <laughs> i need to be ordered around a little bit I need to be domed a little bit i need to be gently domed in my <laughs> <laughs> okay so this one's is a bay here i'll admit so you can see the Yes. My hand is so dirty. This is like not <laughs> helping. Um, Your and, hand is the least dirty thing about this entire event. And, <laughs> and this is a Kolinsky sable. Uh, and it's made in France. Why are all the best art supplies made in France? Or they're made in Japan. They're better than us. Um, and this is Escoda. And this is a nice big brush. And these are great for watercolor or gouache. Don't use them for oil. I don't think that's best. Uh, okay. You want your oil brushes to be a totally different, like a boar's hair or whatever. I don't know. I'm fi- still figuring out oil. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Well, I think those are all of the questions that we should answer. Are there any other things that you want people to know about this book? Sell us this book right now, Lisa. Who should buy this? Oh, God. If you're freaky, if you're deaky, if you, <laughs> um, if I mean, you want to light a tiki. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really, it's just like for the fan of Walt who wants more. <laughs> yeah, I feel like if you, especially if you came upon Lisa's work sort of more recently, it's a really good look into sort of like the genesis of how you ended up where you are now yeah and like what you were like in your 20s kind of yeah i was a mess a sweet mess um what needed to be answered is yeah what do you think she would think of you now oh my god oh my god if me in my 20s could see me now she'd be so stoked because i don't know i think like life's pretty pretty cool although if she saw everything else that's happening she'd be like ah <laughs> she'd be like but at what cost <laughs> yeah <laughs> she'd be like well pro uh you ride horses a lot so that's cool uh I wasn't able to do that in my 20s I took yeah. a long break from horsing um now I'm back baby and then she'd think all the you know two converti stuff pretty damn cool but uh yeah all the other stuff not so much yeah and then I'd be like shh, shh it's okay little Lisa it'll be okay <laughs> you have to fix it <laughs> you only you can change the world yeah. now tell everyone <laughs> and then she would she would run around telling people and they'd all think she was crazy <laughs> yeah it's like back to the future if he couldn't convince anyone of anything <laughs> yeah, it'd be How so- come in back to the future he, he didn't try and fix any of the stuff that goes wrong other than just like making his parents fuck each other I know. Why was that his one thing? Oh, if only my parents, they need to fuck. <laughs> it's like, come on. It's the ultimate like Reagan movie of like, yeah, I just need to go back and make my parents rich. Yeah. It's so selfish. It's a, it was a simpler time. It's time to cancel Back to the Future, guys. And that's what <laughs> we really came here to do today. <laughs> it's too problematic. <gasps> Um, well, I hope you guys enjoyed this. I think we should, I mean, I think we should call it. We're, we're going a little bit under the hour, but I think that's fine. I think that's fine. Um, I think this I, was very successful. 
I think so too. I am so excited that more people get to read this stuff now, especially because I'm pretty sure I lost my zine, my copy of it. I think when I moved from San Francisco to New York, I collected all, all my zines and I was going to donate them to the zine library. And then the boxes got mixed up and they went to Goodwill where I'm sure they went in the trash, which is Damn just it. like, if I could back to the future, I would prevent that from happening and well, not do ever... anything about the 2016 election. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> if you ever want a new copy of that OG zine, I will give you one. I have a box of them. The long con of our friendship has finally come to an end. The satisfaction. <laughs> you really put in a lot of time and work <laughs> into this. <laughs> All right, let's throw it back to Powell's. Thank you for having us. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you both so much. Yeah. And thank you everyone for, for joining us for this event. It was a pleasure to host Lisa Hanawalt and Emily Heller. Please consider purchasing a copy of Lisa's book, I Want You, by visiting us at powells.com. And while you are there, please be sure to check out our lineup of upcoming virtual events. And we look forward to seeing you again. Lisa, Emily, thanks again. We're so grateful. And take care. Thanks thank everyone you. for joining. Yep. Thanks, thanks everybody.